My name is John Quigley, and I'm the director of this uh, Berkeley program on housing and urban policy. Um, and several times a year, we try to sponsor a couple of seminars and, and uh, group discussions on topics of interest to policy, um, interest to students in professional programs, um, and, uh, and so forth. Um, this, this, is, uh, this is the first we've had, or the second we've had this semester, I guess. If you watch your emails, if you're not on our email list, you should. You are now. You are now. <laughs> uh, Larry Rosenthal, who is the executive director of this program, will grab you after lunch and try and get your email address so we can track you down. You're more than welcome to turn up for all of our events. Uh, we have a, uh, a major conference now scheduled for um, early in September, September 8th, I guess. Um, and if you're, if Larry's got your email address, you'll find out more than you ever wanted to know about it um, soon. Uh, the topic of discussion today um, is related to the current pushback in the economy and its effects on housing markets, its effect on housing, its effect on policy. Can you do anything about it at uh, the national level? Um, and then if you could do something at the national level, there is this problem of the state of California and the links between the government of the state of California, the government of local jurisdictions, and their effect upon urban development or the opportunities for, should I say, rechanneling resources uh, to affect the level of urban development or the type of urban development. Um, we're fortunate to have three experts with us who will make brief presentations, and there'll be opportunities for fighting and uh, discussion um, afterwards. Uh, Rebecca Blanco oversees the implementation of the Neighborhood Stab Stabilization Program, um, and she's in the uh, uh, HUD's Office of Community Development, Community Planning and Development. Um, Kara Douglas is the Affordable Ho Housing Program Manager at the Department of Conservation and Development for Contra Costa County. Um, and John Nagel is a partner in the law firm of Goldfarb and Lippmann, um, where he has worried about problems of redevelopment and real estate law for uh, at least uh, uh, several decades. Uh, uh, so we have a representative from the federal government, the local government, and the private sector trying to mediate this or to try and make this system work. Um, that, who each will make brief presentations, and as I said, there will be plenty of time for questions and comments afterwards. We'll go in alphabetical order, if that's okay. Rebecca, you want to go first? Yeah. Good afternoon. Okay, so the Neighborhood Stabilization Program um, was originally acted under the Bush administration in 2008 under the Housing and Economic Recovery Act. Um, it was also referred to as NSP-1. Um, and it was initially created to mitigate the negative impact of the housing decline. There were a record number of foreclosure filings and, you know, the economy was starting to collapse and they um, decided to create a program to try and stem some of the bleeding that was taking place. And the intention of the program was not to prevent foreclosures, but to go in after the foreclosures happened to try and stabilize the neighborhoods and try and revitalize some of the blight that was happening due to the foreclosure problem. So at the time, um, the Wall Street giant Bear Stearns was collapsing. Um, remember, this is 2007, 2008, when they were talking about um, enacting some changes and trying to figure out what the federal government can do. Banks were collapsing or merging. Uh, foreclosures were at a record high. Everybody was um, you know, thinking, well, we know what happened in the late 80s with all the foreclosure crisis. We don't want that again. So local governments were lobbying the federal government to do something, anything. Um, the reduced tax revenues were impacting local government's ability to try and fix the problem themselves. Uh, the, market, the credit market was extremely tight. People were unable to refinance their mortgages. There was a lot of creative lending going on. I mean, we're still seeing the effects of it. We have some people that still have interest-only loans that won't even come due until 2016, 2018. So there was a lot of pretty creative financing. Plus, the mortgage companies were doing mortgage-backed securities. So as these banks were folding, there was the issue of how do you even foreclose on a property or how do you even figure out who owns the note to this? Because with the mortgage-backed securities, 
sometimes you'd look at a property and there were four or five different owners, the way it was split up. So there were a lot of issues. We got pretty creative with our financing. There was some financing that was given out to the residential market that really was traditionally commercial financing and it would not work in a residential market and I think we found that. Plus the administration at the time was really pushing home ownership and HUD was also, you know. I think we've realized that home ownership might not be for everyone. Um, but at the time we thought, you know, if you can have a house, you can have the American dream and maybe not, maybe not so much. Um, and unemployment was on the rise with a whopping 4.8%. I mean, we're at, you know, above 10% now and we just thought, oh my gosh, these are unprecedented numbers. What are we going to do? So um, the federal government decided, well, let's bail out the banks, right? They were collapsing. Let's put a program in place to fix the banks, and they started talking about HERA because the housing market was also experiencing, you know, unprecedented effects. And so um, HERA established um, for the Neighborhood Stabilization Program five eligible things you could do with it. Uh, a lot of local governments looked at it and said, how is this going to help us? We can't prevent foreclosure with this program. We can't help homeowners who are really having problems do anything. But okay, the federal government's going to give us this program. What can we do? Well, you can establish a financing mechanism, which is basically lend money out to developers, purchase and rehabilitate residential properties, establish land banks, demolish blighted structures, or redevelopment. And that's pretty much all we gave local governments at first. You know, the Congress talked about this great program, NSP, and then they gave it to HUD to write some regulations and we said, okay, well, this is what they told us we can do. What, what does it really mean? So the original source of NSP, as I said, was HERA, and that was $3.9 billion. And then as President Obama came into office, they started talking about the Recovery Act and what can we really do. Now, we don't want to say that there's a recession because, you know, the big R word, we don't want panic. So everybody was refusing at the time to really call what was going on in the economy a recession. So um, let's see. So HERA was released, and, and we got 3.9 with NSP1, and then we went to ERA. We like, our, we like our acronyms at the federal government. So the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And NSP was again given money in that act. And what we said is, okay, well, with NSP1, we're going to give it to entitlement jurisdictions, people that work with our programs, the community development block grant on the regular basis. And then for NSP2, we said, okay, well, we got a lot of complaints from, you know, the nonprofit sector that they weren't able to really participate in the program, so we'll make this a competitive grant. And then they came out with the Dodd-Frank Dodd -Frank Wall Street Reform Act, which just is in the process of being implemented. And another $1 billion was given for NSP3. So what did we have to do? So we get this money from the federal government and they, you know, or from Congress really, and they give it to HUD. And we had to write some regulations. And we had to figure out how to make it work. And we kind of got to this, well, we'll get close to trying to give you guys some guidance, but we don't really know what we're doing. It's a brand new program. HUD hasn't changed for about 30 years. so. We'll throw something out there and see what happens. So we got close, but not quite. We kind of developed policy guidance while the grantees were trying to carry out the program. Um, you know, a lot of people have referred to it as, you know, building the plane while you're flying it. The grantees have referred to it as, oh, HUD's going to make us build the plane while we're flying it. But HUD gave them boat parts and duct tape and said, there you go, build a plane. Um, and we didn't have a lot of time to provide training. NSP1. Grantees had 18 months to obligate all of their money, 18 months to go out and find the projects and say, this is what we're going to do, and we're still in the process of carrying the program out, but 18 months, you've got to get it, tell us exactly what's going to go on. You have to have the properties purchased and have it being implemented. And so when NSP1 came out, we had never done a program like it. It's kind of, um, they said use CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant, as your fallback. If we didn't write a policy for it, just use CDBG because we're not really sure. But NSP ended up more kind of like home. It's kind of, you know, this kind of stepchild and you're not sure which parent really is the real parent of it and trying to figure out what's going on. And we didn't 
think it all the way through. And so we had to be able to change. As the market was moving, we said you have to target your money. We want to make sure there's an impact in neighborhoods so that when people drive through a neighborhood and see neighborhood stabilization, they can actually tell that the neighborhood has been stabilized, not a house here and a house there and a house, you know, five miles away. You don't want a house here and there. You really want to stabilize a neighborhood. Look at the intent of the program. Um, but the markets were changing so rapidly, it was a little bit difficult. So HUD had to provide a little bit of guidance. And, you know, it's kind of, I refer to things as, it's kind of like the burnt waffle theory. You know, you, you make your batter and you pour it in the waffle maker and you open it back up and it's kind of crooked and a little half burnt. That's kind of how NSP started. I mean, it wasn't quite right. You wouldn't serve it to anybody. I mean, it's this burnt <laughs> waffle. And here you are like, okay, well, I, I got close, but not quite. So we had to modify what we were doing. We really had to look at it. And this is where the local government was absolutely great at coming to us and saying, okay, you told us we had to find foreclosed properties, but all we can find is short sales because now people are done walking away. Can short sales work? And we said, mm, okay. And you know, well, you said we had to target the money, but what does that really mean? And first we said, well, you could do public facilities. And then we came back and said, no, you can't do public facilities. And you know, so we've kind of been looking at things as we go along and actually changing for once, which the federal government is not used to doing. We're not used to saying, okay, well, we were wrong, let's change it. And so we decided to get, we, Congress said, you have to report on this money. We need to know, you know expand, expend, expend. So we also didn't have a way to get grantees to report. We're um, not very technically proficient at the federal government, so things like online reporting is a little bit foreign. Um, you know, we do things kind of behind the curve. So we decided to use what's called the Disaster Recovery and Grant Reporting System, which was used for things like Hurricane Katrina, major natural disasters. Foreclosures isn't necessarily a natural disaster. It's a disaster. Let's, you know, it is, it's bad. But it's not necessarily a natural disaster. So we had to kind of tweak that along the way. Got close, but not quite. I don't think it's still quite right. We're still releasing. I mean, we're on our third round of funding. You know, we're two years into the program, and we're still releasing updates to the system to get it to work. Um, we also normally have technical assistance out of each and every field office. But HUD decided that they'd put it into headquarters and they'd have the field offices actually give input for once and tell them if we thought our grantees were doing okay and what needed to be done. So we've provided a lot of proactive technical assistance. About a year ago, we had a big conference at the Claremont about how you, know, how you should design your program and how to actually meet the rules and regulations. And as we were developing policies, I said earlier, kind of the short sale thing, we had to keep refining what we were doing. We had to look at the market and kind of change with it. And so now we're allowing short sales. And um, we looked at it, and we said, you had to target your money in NSP1 and tell us where you were going and what you were doing. So grantees got really creative and just put down every single census tract in their city. It's like, oh, HUD won't figure it out. You know, if we just list every census tract, they told us to target it. And we don't say the whole city, you know, will they know? Well, no, we really didn't realize that until a little later. <laughs> So NSP3, we said, we really want you to deeply target. Go down to the block group. Look at what you're doing. We have a mapping tool now, um, and we've gotten better at our data collection. So we use a, a lot of resources to get data. There's a mapping tool on the NSP website, the huduser.org website, where you can select a census track, and it'll tell you what the risk score, what, what you, know, you can expect as far as recovery in that area. We also decided to, instead of suggesting green rehabilitation, requiring green rehabilitation. So, and it's attachment C of the NSP3 notice, but it's saying if something's obsolete, replace it. Generally, you know, the federal government goes with the lowest bidder, but now we're looking at sometimes you go with the lowest bidder, but you don't get the best product. So it's not about even the, the quality, it is about the quality of, of the product, but it's also about the lifespan of the product. You can put, you can go cheap and put laminate countertops that might last five years in a rental unit, or you can put granite in, which now is actually, the cost has come down significantly, or a solid surface, and you're going to get 20 years out of it, because if it's a rental unit, it's going to keep turning over. So we also thought, well, with the economy continuing 
to not recover, and now we're officially calling it a recession. Um, you know, as you're doing these programs, you might actually want to hire people that live in your community to work on the programs. There's construction industry has taken a huge hit, so hire the construction workers that live in the areas that you're targeting. And, you know, there's so many people that are losing their homes to foreclosure. You might want to provide a rental strategy because those people have to go somewhere. So where it makes sense, have a strategy to provide quality, affordable rental housing. Some places like the Central Valley, the house prices have dropped so dramatically that somebody that's low income can now really, truly afford a home and sustain the home, not just purchase a home, actually buy it and live in it for a long period of time. And we also said, you know, this really is a housing program, so no more public facilities, no more infrastructure, focus on housing. And it's not, it's not just for urban county cities, you can, or urban county grantees, you can go throughout the county. It, it's not just for one or the other. We're kind of changing things up a little bit. So we went from, you know, NSP1 entitlement only, NSP2 competitive, NSP3, well, let's go where the need is. So even if these grantees aren't, even if these cities and local governments have never worked with HUD, they've worked with the state of California, which does things their own way. Um, you know, you can now work with HUD. So we're looking at where are the true foreclosure problems. And we capped demolition. Um, there's some areas, Detroit has gotten a waiver because majority of Detroit just needs to be demolished and start over. I mean, let's face it, some of the stuff just isn't worth saving. It doesn't provide a historical significant. And quite honestly, it really can't be repaired. Um, we were talking earlier and the East Bay specifically has a really large housing stock that's much older than the rest of the country. You know, you had the 1908 earthquake in San Francisco or 1906, and everybody moved to the East Bay. So, you know, the units here are worth saving. They're not that bad, but there's lead-based paint, there's electrical issues, so a little more needs to be done, but they don't need to be demoed. So we capped the demolition. We also changed before, they said you have to expend your money and any program you, income you get in. Well, if you've got this deadline to meet, how are you going to spend the program income and the grant money and everything all at once? So we said, you know, you just need to expend amount in, an amount equal to your grant. If you get program income, carry on the program, but you're not going to get, you, know, you don't have to give that back to HUD. And we've also said, you know, NSP is not a one-stop shop. You should look at layering funds. Uh, banks have Community Reinvestment Act funds. Use those. Use other federal funds. Layer the projects and use NSP1 with NSP3 to really make the biggest impact possible. A lot of focus has been on how do you design the program to make it effective. And with NSP1, you know, we said, here's this program, figure it out, let us know how you do. And we said, okay, now you really do have to look at the market conditions. Rehab resale cannot work in an area where people can't get financing you know, where there's no affordable rental housing. So you have to really look at your market and understand what's going on in the market and evaluate the program before you even start. Um, the other thing is the local governments that we've given the money to, their tax base has shrunk. And so a lot of people have looked at the furlough issue and said, you know what, it makes more sense for me to retire. Or they've, because of the tax base shrinking, they've had to lay off a lot. So we told local governments, partner. You know, if you don't have the capacity, build it somewhere. Work with other nonprofits or work with even for-profit developers. Just ensure that the regulations are being followed and that you have the capacity to do the program as it is intended to stabilize a neighborhood. Um, you can use other funds to impact, you know, private investment. There's a lot of different ways to leverage funding if you can get out there and find it. Um, and then, you know, you have to look at your target area, make sure you're staying in your target area. And what we're having problems with is target areas are moving. The market's moving. So NSP2 was a competitive application which was scored. And I know the people in this room can talk about it pretty, pretty well, but you had to meet certain criteria to be able to get funding, and one of them was the target area. Well, that was a year and a half ago. Is the market still the same? Nope, foreclosures are moving. 
Um, and so it's you know looking at where your target area is and if you can actually carry the program out. And we've also partnered with a group called the National Community Stabilization Trust. And this group got all the banks in a room and said, one key factor of the Neighborhood Stabilization Program that I haven't mentioned yet is that it is a requirement that you purchase the properties below market value. How do you do that without driving the market down was a big question at first. And who's, what banks are really going to play? I mean, you go to a bank and say, I want you to discount your property 15%. They're going to say, uh-uh, not doing it. I'll let the property sit there. I don't care. So HUD changed that and said, OK, 1%. And they got a group together called the National Community Stabilization Trust, which a lot of the grantees look work with, and they do what's called a first look program. So before they list it with their broker, before they even get an agent, after they have the house returned to them, they give local governments a period of time to evaluate the property to see if it would work for them. And so trying to go through it so that I can have time, and please feel free to ask questions. Um, but resources are at nsphelp.info um, is where we have tons of, that's the other thing we did that was really great, is we actually developed a website that had resources, you know, templated agreements, templated documents, and kind of all this policy guidance that we were working on throughout the time has been listed there. So any questions? I think we can hold questions. Okay, so perfect. All three presenters. Um, so we get three different perspectives. We now go from a national perspective uh, to a regional perspective, uh, and, uh, and in particular, uh, county government and its relation with state government and with local governments. Uh, Carrie Douglas, as I said, is affordable housing program manager, <coughs> excuse me, in Contra Costa County. Um, and I will turn the program over to her. Hi, I'm Kara Douglas. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Contra Costa County, it starts just north of here in Richmond and then moves around east. <laughs> And it's kind of just over the, the east side of the hills. So kind of keep this image in mind. I mean, a lot of NSP, we kind of took um, homely little houses and made them less homely little houses. Um, it, you know, we were working in, in distressed neighborhoods, not in the areas that uh, um, Las Vegas had with a lot of new subdivisions and, and housing tracks. Oh, that is small. But I think you get, the colors are bright enough that you can kind of get the, the idea of what's going on here. This is a history of subprime lending in Contra Costa County between 1997 and 2005. And it's a little hard to see, but in the 1997 on the far left side, that's kind of Richmond. Um, there's a little bit of red in 1998, a little bit more red. The yellow's coming up. Um, the red is the, the most significant. More than 50% of the mortgage loans were subprime. And when I started working at the county in 1998, 1999, there was a lot of talk about, oh my gosh, there's a lot of subprime lending. The low-income and minority neighborhoods are really being harmed by this, and we've got to stop. We've got to get out there, do some um, financial education, and stop these lenders from taking advantage of these people. And it, and it, and it generally kind of worked. You can see in, in 2000, 2001, the red and the orange is gone, and it's just kind of yellow. But it was kind of like a cancer that had gone into remission and then came back with a vengeance and metastasized all the way across the county. And you can see the subprime lending really started picking up in 2002 and then on up until 2005, which according to the Federal Reserve Bank was the peak of subprime lending. I wonder if it was 2006, but that's how bad it had gotten in 2005. And those bright red areas really do align themselves very much with the low end low-income and minority neighborhoods in Contra Costa. Are those originations? Yes. <laughs> so then this is what happened. 2005 was the height of subprime lending, but a lot of those loans were uh, three, three years of interest only or five years of interest only or, or a very low introductory teaser rate or maybe a 1% teaser rate until they reset after three or five years. So not a lot of foreclosures in 2006, but 2007 it starts hitting. And again, it's a little hard to see on that slide, but one dot equals one foreclosure. So in 2008, there's a whole lot of dots there. And obviously that overlaid pretty well with where the subprime lending was. The um, not so dotted areas of the county 
or the central part of the county, much more affluent. Um, homeowners that had been homeowners for a much longer period of time. And on that west shore, even some of those homeowners were fairly established homeowners, but the lenders went out and talked people into refinancing on equity in their home, and people that had been fairly stable in their houses now were foreclosed on because they had taken out too much and couldn't afford the mortgages anymore. So this is an interesting slide. In this case Shiller Home Price Index, the low tier, the blue line that rises up and drops at the top of this slide is the, the lower third of the home prices. The middle tier is kind of the middle priced homes and that high tier is the higher third of the home prices. So if you remember the map with Central County, the part that wasn't affected, that's more the middle and the high tier. The run up wasn't as so high, but the drop wasn't so bad either. And again, it's that low tier, the low income minority neighborhoods that got um, the unsustainable run up and then the, the huge crash. And when you hear about percentages of loss in value, you hear about a number for the San Francisco Bay Area. You don't hear about numbers in specific neighborhoods. So this is one example in the kind of northeastern shore of Contra Costa County in Bay Point. And it puts some real numbers on some of those graphs you've been seeing. February 2006, a two bedroom, one bath home. Uh, Habitat for Humanity actually purchased this and rehabbed it. They called it the cat house. Because when you walked in, we took Rebecca in there too. When you walked in, it just reeked of cat. Habitat had to put in about $85,000 worth of improvements in this house. They replaced floors, walls, doors, windows, and entire kitchens and bathrooms. They really had to, to bring it down and rebuild it. They bought it for $45,000, put about $85,000 in it, not counting transaction costs. And after rehab value, it's $120,000. So here's a public policy question. Is this a good use of our money? <laughs> and we can, we can talk about that and debate that. So that gives you a sense of, of where, where we were when um, Congress and the President started looking at this. <laughs> and Congress came up with an idea and said, well, there was two bills. You know, there was, there was HERA that Rebecca talked about, and there was also TARP, the Trouble Asset Relief Program. And TARP was however many billions of dollars that went to help the banks out. And I kind of saw HERA as a companion piece to help the neighborhoods out. So Congress had this idea. Bush signed it into law. And it, it came down to the county. And the government, the federal government, wanted the money out fast. It was to stimulate the economy. It was to stop the decline. It was to stabilize neighborhoods. It's not something that could happen in general government time of a couple of years to plan and then a couple of years to find somebody to do it and a couple of years to get it done. They wanted it out really quickly. Well, you know, we're government. <laughs> and they wanted it smart. They wanted it well done. They wanted the taxpayers' money well spent. We can do smart, we can do fast. It's really hard to do smart and fast. <laughs> but <laughs> HUD did come out to help us. And they were developing regulations. And they came to the local government and met with us and said, hey, we've got a plan for you. And we said, okay, <laughs> we'll take that on. And we met, and Rebecca talked about it, we met with roadblocks from the beginning. The banks had absolutely no interest whatsoever in talking to us. They had no preparation for this crisis. They had no infrastructure. When they got the occasional foreclosure, one or two percent foreclosure rate was, was fairly standard. They would send it out to a third party. They didn't take care of any of that transaction themselves. They'd send it out. This third party agency would go through the whole uh, collection process, foreclosure process, and turning the properties around. Now they had hundreds, thousands of foreclosures to deal with. And they started doing the same process, sending it out to these third parties. They had relationships. They had agents that would go out and sell. And they had investors that they knew. And they were selling very quickly to their investor friends. And we would pick up the phone and call the bank. We didn't get a return phone call. We didn't even get to discuss the fact we wanted to buy it at a 15% discount below market value. That house that they had made a $280,000 mortgage on that was now valued at $45,000, the bank already lost their shirt. And to take a discount from there was not really kind of a high priority. 
and they had their TARP funds. That didn't come with any regula regulations that they worked to help fix this problem. So we met. We got together with a new group of friends. We had our local group. Um, the East Bay cities and counties have been meeting for a number of years occasionally on different topics that are important to us. But we needed to find some new friends. And fortunately, we were able to find them. And there was a few that I think really deserve special mention. Um, Enterprise Community Partners, NeighborWorks, and Local Community Support Corporation. They had started working with a local nonprofit in Minneapolis and had formed this National Community Stabilization Trust. The trust hired people that had worked in Fannie Mae in very high positions and knew the banking industry, knew who to call, and knew the language to speak. They said, you never use the word discount when you're talking to a bank. You show them where the cost savings are. If they sell to us quickly, they don't have the holding costs. They don't have the transaction costs of paying high agent fees. They don't have the, the problems with squatters and vandalism that they have to go back and fix. So we can show how working with us will save them money in the long run. And that, that made a significant difference. So we met other jurisdictions kind of working through our problems, meeting with those three national organizations, and we finally got plans together that actually got us to where we could move forward. And so this is what we came up with. We, <laughs> you know, like Rebecca said, <laughs> I came with a plan and we said, okay, and we'd start out, and then somebody in D.C. would say, but what about Shouldn't we have this requirement? Oh, we forgot to tell them that they were supposed to do that. So we kind of moved forward and back and then forward again. And somehow we ended up actually getting money out and buying houses and rehabbing houses. And what we didn't have time to do was the other part of, of Rebecca's talk and leveraging other funds. Because we were forced to spend the money so quickly, we didn't really have time to go out and find other sources to make our money go farther, which is what we want to do our next step. As, we, as the homes start to sell and we start to get those repayments back and we're building up a little bit of a, a pile of money to go out and spend again, and we didn't really have an opportunity to work with some of our redevelopment, in our redevelopment areas and with the redevelopment agencies and leverage other local initiatives that were already in play. This map, the uh, red are redevelopment project areas. And the little purple dots, and some of you probably can't see little purple dots at all, but they're there. Those are through another uh, government initiative through the Association of Bay Area Governments through their focus program. Those are what's called priority de development areas, where jurisdictions are going to really kind of try to intensively develop. Most of those are uh, also transit-oriented. And then the, the kind of yellowy goldy stuff are NSP target areas on our NSP2 application, which we didn't get funded because we made a stupid mistake. <laughs> so that kind of takes us over to Jack and the redevelopment portion of it. Thanks very much, Kara. And now for the third leg of the stool, federal government, local government, state government. Um, I'll turn the um, proceedings over to Jack Nick. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Rebecca and Kara have done a good job of taking a, a very serious and sobering problem and, and at least showing the human dimensions of trying to work through it. Um, I'm not sure this next topic is going to be. Um, uh, it's certainly sobering. I don't know if we're going to work through it well, but in the last uh, three months, uh, there has burst onto the political and public policy scene a major debate about the continuation of a 60-year-old program in California known as redevelopment, which is California's primary program de facto for urban revitalization, economic development, and affordable housing. Um, I'm going to try to, uh, in 15 minutes, uh, put some policy context on this debate 
which was going to come to a uh, head in the next couple months as part of the state budget negotiations uh, by describing uh, what redevelopment is, how it works, uh, how it has evolved to meet uh, state needs uh, at the local level, um, how it works in tandem with various federal programs, including the NSP program, um, why Governor Brown has decided that it should be immediately eliminated, uh, and what some policy alternatives might be that might allow it to continue rather than be eliminated, but in a fashion that better serves 21st century needs uh, of California for urban revitalization and affordable housing. California redevelopment, as I say, as I said, has existed for approximately 60 years. Uh, it came out of uh, federal urban renewal and public housing routes in the late 1940s. Uh, it's a program to deal with distressed communities uh, throughout California's urban areas. Interestingly, though, it's a program that is not administered through one monolithic state agency in Sacramento that doles out resources to 400 plus communities. Uh, but instead is operated at the local level under some state rules that are codified, uh, but by 400 different communities, cities, and counties. Um, that has the advantage uh, of allowing for innovation and flexibility that you wouldn't get through a monolithic state program to address uh, needs on the ground in particular communities and to address opportunities in those communities. Uh, on the other hand, it can also have the disadvantages of a uh, disaggregated local program where not every community has the same level of competence uh, and some communities uh, decide to run their programs in ways that are parochial in nature and don't necessarily achieve the state objectives for urban revitalization, economic development, and affordable housing. Uh, as we'll see, redevelopment combines uh, a series of legal and financial tools Redevelopment does not seek to take the place of the private market, but rather to work through the private market, to take distressed areas where the private market has uh, various dysfunctions due to physical and economic characteristics that keep property owners, developers, investors, and lenders uh, from investing because there's just not sufficient return and they're not trusting that their neighbors will invest so that if they do invest, they may be left on their own, uh, and tries through the redevelopment tool to infuse just enough public support to make the private markets begin to work again so that the private sector can continue to do, do the job it does well, but here in formerly distressed communities. Uh, as I mentioned, redevelopment is often used in tandem with federal programs, and we'll explore that a little bit more. Uh, redevelopment, a major watershed for redevelopment and for all of state and local relations was Prop 13 in 1977. And for reasons I'll explain, that really changed the dynamic uh, of how redevelopment is thought of at the local and state level. Uh, it's a controversy that's been festering now for over three decades. Uh, it's come to a head through a series of uh, chain reaction of political uh, activity at the state level that I'll describe and has led to the situation where we are today, where we are looking at the imminent uh, dissolution of this program, uh, unless we can think our way through a way to reform it, refine it, repurpose it, uh, probably streamline it down to a smaller program, but one that can continue to serve important community revitalization needs in our state. How does redevelopment work? Uh, every city and county is allowed to activate a redevelopment agency. And uh, it's a simple step to do. In most communities, the city council um, uh, activates a redevelopment agency and serves also as the redevelopment agency board. It's a separate legal entity, but it's typically run by the same elected officials, whether at the city level or the board of supervisors in the case of a county redevelopment agency. Um, redevelopment can really get going when it adopts, uh, when the city council or board of supervisors adopts a redevelopment plan, a broad blueprint. Uh, and designates a project area that needs to be a distressed area meeting certain uh, criteria for economic and physical problems. Unfortunately, the term used in redevelopment law is blight, not a name that any community wants to have associated with it. But basically, you, ch you can't just uh, you know, take a census tract and say we're going to use it. As a project area, you have to show that it meets certain criteria in order to be eligible for the financial and legal tools of redevelopment. 
the primary tool of redevelopment, the one I'm going to focus on for a couple of minutes because it's really key to the whole debate that we're having right now in the state, is tax increment financing. Uh, tax increment financing is a reallocation of normal local property taxes. Local property taxes typically go to city government, county government, special districts, and, and education districts to provide basic services. Redevelopment is a tool that can come in when a redevelopment plan is adopted and a project area, a distressed project area is created. You take a snapshot of what the property assessed value is in that project area in that year. The property taxes attributable to that fixed value, sometimes called the frozen base value, continue to go in future years to those same local governments that I described so that they can continue to provide local services. But the growth in property taxes due to increases in assessed value above that base year value are what is called tax increment. And by and large, those, redevelop those property taxes, those tax increment funds go to redevelopment agencies to be plowed back into the distressed communities to help alleviate the physical and economic problems that qualified them in the first place for redevelopment. There are certain prescribed uses for tax increment. 20% of every tax increment dollar a redevelopment agency receives must go back for affordable housing in, in the community. Another 20 to 30% typically must be passed through or sent back to those local governments that I described so that they can continue to provide services for the communities that are in project areas. But the balance is then available for non-affordable housing type activities to revitalize communities. And I'll describe some of the tools and techniques for that. Um, it's important to describe the controversy or tension that has arisen because of tax increment financing, particularly after Proposition 13, because Proposition 13 basically, as some of you know, uh, said there will be a fixed maximum property tax rate and there will be fixed limits on how much the assessed value can grow every year. And so therefore the total property tax pie uh, shrunk considerably in 1977 and has grown at a very limited pace since. Property taxes traditionally had been the primary source for local governments, cities and counties to fund their service programs and also to fund their capital improvement programs, their public infrastructure that helped support the growth in California and in urban communities in California. With Proposition 13, basically the ability to do capital programs through the traditional property tax source dried up. Redevelopment agencies and communities that have created redevelopment agencies tend to see tax increment as a positive tool where they go into distressed communities, focus money to create new investment by the private sector that just wouldn't have occurred otherwise. And in the long run, that bigger property tax pie serves the benefit of all the taxing entities, all the local governments. Some of the local governments who are forced to have their funds, in their view, invested in a local project area tend to think of tax increment as just siphoning revenue that would have occurred anyway for parochial local programs, taking away resources needed by those local governments to provide the services that they are charged with providing. The state has a special role, an indirect but important role in tax increment financing in that the system of state educational funding requires that there be a somewhat equal playing field among all school districts in the state so that both rich and poor districts have a certain minimum level of assistance per student per year, regardless of the amount of local revenues they can produce. So a district with a low amount of property taxes will have a larger amount of subsidy from the state of California to get to that basic per student uh, assistance level, whereas a community that can support more property tax revenue needs less of a state subvention to get to that same level. Well, if a school district is in a redevelopment project area so that some of the property taxes are being used by the redevelopment agency, that means in the state's view, less money that could have been raised through property taxes at the local level, therefore more state subsidy or subvention, which can over the years have a billions of dollars impact on the state general fund by having to, in their view, backfill what redevelopment has taken away. I spent a fair amount of time on this because I think um, it's really central to the debate we're having now is how different entities at the state and local level think about tax increment financing. 
Anyway, redevelopment agencies use this tool of tax increment financing for a number of purposes, to assemble land, to get it into private hands that are more likely to use it positively, to fund public infrastructure projects, particularly those that city governments and county governments can no longer fund, to remediate brownfields, uh, contaminated sites that the private sector typically does not want to touch so that they can get it back into the private sector, and to provide other forms of assistance. Uh, redevelopment was initially used uh, as an adjunct to a federal program, urban renewal. Uh, in fact, it was a minor matching tool at the local level where the federal government would put up 87 cents on the dollar and redevelopment would put up the other 13 cents uh, through tax increment to do major urban renewal in large downtowns. Downtown LA, Bunker Hill, um, uh, Golden Gateway Project and Fillmore in San Francisco, downtown Oakland are good examples of urban renewal projects at the federal level when HUD was brand new um, that were assisted in a secondary way by redevelopment. State redevelopment, however, has become a major power program in its own right uh, over the last 60 years. Uh, in the mid-70s, affordable housing became an important component of redevelopment at the state level. Uh, it was seen that for the first 20 or 30 years of the program, redevelopment had tended to tear down more affordable housing than produce. And so the goal was to reorient that, uh, to, to, to realign objectives so that affordable housing production became an important requirement and goal of redevelopment. As I mentioned, Prop uh, 13 changed the whole landscape for local governments. And so a whole host of suburban communities that never in the past would have considered doing redevelopment suddenly saw that as an engine to continue to do capital improvements, public infrastructure, using the redevelopment technique in areas that most of us would look at and say, that's not my idea of blight of urban uh, physical and social problems, but we went from under 100 redevelopment agencies before Prop 13 to 400 agencies that we have today, uh, in part because of that impetus of Prop 13, that un of many unintended consequences of Proposition 13. Progressive redevelopment agencies um, currently are using redevelopment, again, to really support affordable housing, uh, to facilitate the creation of jobs for underemployed or unemployed residents in project areas, particularly in um, uh, growing sectors of the state economy, and insisting with infill development. Redevelopment can be a, a major tool for helping the state grow in and up rather than out on the fringes. Um, to achieve various state objectives of reducing greenhouse gas emissions and uh, cutting down the overall cost of our public urban infrastructure. Um, as I mentioned, redevelopment has worked uh, well with many um, federal programs over the years. I've listed some of them uh, down to today with the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Uh, some Redevelopment projects that you may be familiar with in the immediate area of campus, uh, the Brower Center at the west edge of campus, um, Kittredge in Oxford, I think, a mixed use project, brand new, um, retail on the ground floor, Gathers restaurant, uh, an office building upstairs, and over 100 units of affordable housing that were supported by redevelopment uh, funding. And also uh, several HUD programs were involved and various federal tax credit programs were involved in producing that project. Uh, the 4th Street uh, area in West Berkeley is a, state, is a Berkeley redevelopment project. Um, Emeryville almost entirely is a redevelopment project area. Um, major retail but also major high-tech industries built on an old uh, minefield uh, of uh, industrial uses from the early and mid 20th century revitalized through redevelopment uh, brownfield remediation. Uh, downtown Oakland, through several generations, including the creation of homes for 10,000 residents to get them back into downtown Oakland, a program espoused and with a particularly innovative use of redevelopment between 1998 and 2006 by the mayor at that time, a gentleman named Jerry Brown, um, who definitely knew how to use redevelopment and saw what it could do at the local level. <clears throat> uh, so redevelopment today, we have nearly 400 active redevelopment agencies uh, with 750 redevelopment project areas, $8 billion a year of revenues, of which about $5 billion is this tax increment, property tax that I've been talking about, 
$30 billion of outstanding debt. 12% um, of all property taxes in the state now go into redevelopment coffers. Opponents say that's just gotten way out of hand. Proponents say, well, that's because redevelopment has been successful in generating new assessed value. According to the California Redevelopment Association, redevelopment produces 300,000 jobs a year. Um, as an aside for you public policy analysts or uh, those of you educating yourself to be so, this debate about redevelopment has a lot of ideology about it, a lot of preconceived notions, a lot of political rhetoric, and very, very little solid public policy analysis, very little research and data to determine how effective redevelopment is, why it's effective where it is, and why it is not effective where it is not. And so we are having an ideological debate with very little po solid policy anal analysis behind it. Agency spent over a billion dollars on affordable housing in the most recent reporting year, helping 20,000 households and 7,000 homes. Uh, now, for the debate. In a program that's administered locally at 400 communities, you are gonna have misuse, abuse, waste, and quite frankly, even some corruption. I've listed there some of the downsides, some of the uh, abuses that have been pointed out about redevelopment, uh, true in some cases. Uh, certainly perceived, I think, to be more widespread than it actually is. Um, CARES agency is a good example of hundreds out there that are doing their best and doing a good job. But there are agencies that really are abusing the system. Um, but beyond abuse, there's just a fundamental public policy debate. Is redevelopment really producing growth in jobs and assessed value? Or is it just redirecting growth that would have occurred from one part of California to another, from one part of a region to another? I would suggest that that debate, while important, is partly misconceived. Because where development happens in our metropolitan areas actually is important. And even if it's not a net growth, where we grow and how we grow has a fundamental importance to equity and sustainability in our communities. And so redevelopment, which quite frankly is about the only tool out there to get the private sector to reinvest on infill sites as opposed to easier to develop um, sites at the edge of our metropolitan areas can be an important tool even if it is not creating net overall development for the state. Uh, then there's just the issue, has redevelopment just grown too big? And in a state with limited resources and quite frankly other crucial needs for social services, health, education at both the K through 12 and higher education level, can we afford this larger program? Well, that debate uh, has turned into a pretty petty fight, quite frankly, between local governments and the state over the past three years. You can see outlined there, and I'm trying to hurry uh, through to get to the, to the bottom line uh, and so that we can answer questions. It's, it's gotten to a dis really a lack of dialogue between the local government and the state level. They don't talk to each other directly about the real problems and how we might collectively solve them. We are all citizens and part of the same state after all. But really, they work through surrogates, through courts and through voters to try to one-up each other. And the most recent one-upmanship was the redevelopment community sponsored and the local city sponsored Proposition 22 that maybe some of you voted on or about last November, where the voters by over 60% said the state can't keep raiding local redevelopment money. So the governor, when he came in, realizing the problem that we have and legitimately trying to deal with that problem, said, well, this is one of the first boxes I'm gonna blow up. If I, can't if I can't reallocate redevelopment tax increment, I'm gonna eliminate it altogether by eliminating redevelopment agencies altogether. There's a tremendous legal debate, which I'm not going to go into, as whether he can do that or not. But in his view and in the view of many Democratic legislators, that can be done and will be done so that redevelopment will be completely dissolved as of July 1st, so that the resources, that $5 billion of resources, can begin to be redirected in the first year toward $1.7 billion of the $26 billion fix that needs to be made to the state budget deficit. Um, covering roughly about 6.5% of that total deficit. And then in future years, redirected back to the local governments that I mentioned to otherwise receive property taxes, and particularly so that cities and counties and school districts can begin to fund some of the realignment of government that, that Governor Brown is proposing by taking some 
functions, uh, criminal justice, um, social services, bringing them back down to the local level for administration, but also having at least some resource for the local governments to deal with. Um, if this were a solid, reasonable, systematic public policy discussion, we probably would not come to a conclusion that either redevelopment should be untouched and should continue to get business as usual, $5 billion a year in the grand scheme of the galaxy of needs of the state. We probably would honestly say that maybe it has gotten too big and maybe there needs to be some reform and redirection. But on the other hand, if we were having that solid policy debate, I doubt we'd say community reinvestment, affordable housing, deserve zero money of the, of the state and local FISC. So let's just blow the whole thing up and go down to zero all at once. I would think that a policy debate would be more along the lines of where redevelopment has worked well in serving state needs, let's accentuate the positive and, and make sure that redevelopment does those functions. Where redevelopment has been abused or works badly, let's eliminate those uses. And let's think of a way that somewhere between zero and five billion Community reinvestment and affordable housing fits into that galaxy of state and local needs, and let's move forward from there. I can't predict to you what the outcome of this debate will be in the next couple of months. If people are interested during the question period, I'd be happy to s speculate about the outcome. One thing I can say is we will continue to see a lot of political rhetoric, a lot of ideology, a lot of preconceived notions, and very, a lot of heat, very little light on the topic, but I hope this discussion at least gives you some sense of what a rational policy discussion about redevelopment and its role in the state might be if we were working in a state that wasn't quite this dysfunctional. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, on that note, there's room for uh, questions, comments, maybe a short speech or two, uh, but quite short. Uh, who would like to go first, please? The, in the most recent reporting year, according to the State Department of Housing and Community Development, which receives um, reports from all 400 redevelopment agencies, there were um, 20,000 households, I believe, that were assisted. Is that in the whole length of the 60 years of redevelopment? No, that's, per, that's, that's, the one, that's the one year. And you can see the breakout of the percentages of income levels help. There's a typo here where it says moderate income and 17% of area. That's moderate income is 120% of median income. Right. So here's my question then on this. Um, I've been studying redevelopment since 84 when the district started in my neighborhood. And basically now they're going to do some housing since 1984 they got some money. And now here we are in 2011 and Jerry Brown has said, hey, so this redevelopment project is going to get some housing done. It's been steered and clustered in the area where I'm from by a local city and the county that has the one that I'm familiar with to be in one specific area and basically has minoritized an area and made it more low income and more black. So basically people in that community have become a bit hesitant to support redevelopment. I try to be neutral and keep studying it and we'll see where Mr. Brown takes it. Perhaps you could tell me about this steering and clustering and using the housing funds now that well, you kind of raised two points. One is that it took the particular redevelopment agency a long time to getting around to actually building affordable housing, and that's unfortunately not that uncommon. Uh, both Rebecca and Kara can tell you how difficult it is to build affordable housing, how much work it takes with local communities, uh, and how much laboring of resources. But still, some agencies have a fairly abysmal record of how long it takes them to do housing. But the other point about is it being clustered in a single place or is it being uh, located throughout the community? The redevelopment law does allow affordable housing to take place throughout a city or county that the redevelopment agency works in, not just in a project area. Although there are still some standards and incentives to do it inside a project area. And I think it's a legitimate policy debate as to whether that's a better or worse way to go. So you, you prefer the spreading about scattered sites? I, 
I've seen it work successfully both, both ways, and it really is a function of how big the individual project area is and what its overall um, income composition is. Thank you. May I talk to that? Next. Yes. Next, please. The proposal, if it's enacted by the legislature, would be that redevelopment agencies are dissolved in less than three months from now. They would be succeeded by something called a successor agency with an oversight board that would be charged with paying off the existing debts that redevelopment agencies already have and liquidating all of the other assets of redevelopment agencies and then paying the property taxes that get freed up to the state. 1.7 billion in the first year, and to local governments in increasing amounts over years after that. It's that dramatic and that soon. It's a, it's a great question, um, and you know many of you are better political pundits probably than I am, but it does all seem very counterintuitive, doesn't it, that the Republican Party would, would be, at least in the very short term, the savers of redevelopment, and that the Democratic Party that generally supports affordable housing and uh, reinvestment in disadvantaged neighborhoods would be the ones trying to get rid of it. It's an incredibly interesting and tortured history. Um, I would suggest that some of it revolves around, uh, for a lot of Democrats at least, that education and teachers unions, well education, I'll, I'll leave it at that, um, carries even more sway than, than the things that they would like to support but don't feel there's enough money to. I think a lot of Republicans, um, you know, some of them are business oriented and see redevelopment as a business oriented program, but a lot of Republicans also see the eminent domain side of it as being very anti, you know, private property rights. And so I think for a lot of them, it's more because the Democrats are proposing it, we're going to be against it. Uh, I do think there's starting to be, and, and you know, that's the basis of politics in California, right? The kind of just fight for the fight, sake of the fight, and, and go to the extremes. I do think there are a range of more moderate Republicans and more moderate Democrats who are willing to try to put together a program of reforming, um, amending, not ending redevelopment, and, and there are some interesting ideas how to do that. But you've fairly characterized the immediate political situation and the ironies in that situation. Are you referring to actual new project areas or, or and, just and money. taking, yeah, I mean, a lot of, once agencies saw this come out, a lot of them tried to turn over a lot of their funds to their local city government. Um, the law, as it came out after that, basically said any asset transfer after January 1st of this year from a redevelopment agency to its city government will be pulled back, and any agreements at any time between a redevelopment agency and its local government going back to the beginning of history will be void as of July 1st. So, is it on? I can't tell. One of the, the problems 
I personally have is NSP was 1% of the TARP money, the total allocation for all three programs. And so there's been a lot of talk at Congress lately, and part of it ties in with the redevelopment agencies because what a lot of our grantees did, counties were not able to purchase properties in their own name. So there was this discussion when NSP came out about who owns the property. Do we give it to the developer? Who, who owns it? So a lot of people put it in the redevelopment agency's name. So that's going to be a whole nother mess. But um, for, for NSP being only 1% of what TARP got, you know, we had really quick timelines. Hurry up, obligate, hurry up, spend your money. But we haven't really seen the full breadth of what the program can offer and what is really going to be done. So there's been a lot of criticism, you know, about, well, you guys got out there and you spent money, but we haven't seen a real impact yet. So NSP actually, uh, just a few months ago, there was the death of NSP Act. I don't remember exactly what they were calling it, but they were basically rescinding NSP funding, saying we're not going to, you know, roll out NSP3. We're going to take the money back, you know, to help the federal deficit. And when you look at it, and we've been trying to get our data, and that's part of the problem with HUD. I mean, Kara said it great. We can either do fast or we can do good. We can't do fast and good. I mean, it just doesn't quite happen that way in government. So we're trying to get really good data collection, and that's part of why we keep changing the releases to the disaster recovery system. Because for us, with the brand new program, it's hard to really tell the impact at this stage. I mean, we're really only not quite two years into actual implementation of the program. And when you think about acquiring and rehabbing a home that's got lead-based paint, that's got asbestos, that's got clay pipes that you have to completely replace, you know, it's, it's hard to tell the true impact at this point. But it is a real issue, as far as I'm concerned, that TARP got all this money, and the banks got all this money, and the banks might be on the verge of recovery. Homeowners aren't. And we're not even close. I mean, if you look at when NSP started, we were at a 4% unemployment rate. Now we've gone well above 10. We're 12, 14, depending on what area you're in. And again, last month, foreclosure fire liens were at record numbers. And um, there's, that's another big policy discussion. You know, there was, there was TARP and then there was HAMP, the, you know, making home affordable. Well, that didn't quite work either. I mean, NSP was never a foreclosure prevention program, and um, I think this goes back to kind of, you know, the whole Republican versus Democrat. It was enacted under the Republicans. The Republicans did not want it to be a foreclosure prevention, and now that they're looking at eliminating the program or talked about eliminating the program, that was their biggest argument, was that it didn't prevent foreclosure. Well, you didn't want it to, so we had to make do with what we got. So, yeah, I mean, it is, that has been a big discussion about, you know, the banks got a ton of money and they're starting to recover and come back, but homeowners and actual Main Street isn't. Wall Street is, Main Street still hasn't. sector, I'll kind of leave economic development and other, other infrastructure out, but on affordable housing, the biggest difficulty we're going to see is on multifamily apartment development, that that has been a vital, critical piece in funding and affordable housing development. There's some federal funds that are available, there's tax credits, there's all sorts of weird esoteric financing out there, but, but redevelopment has been that absolute vital piece to getting the whole development put together. And without that, I, we've got a number of projects that we, we have other federal funds besides the NSP, that was just kind of the focus today, but we have a number of projects that we've allocated millions of dollars to that are absolutely stalled. I mean, we just have pieces of dirt in communities throughout the county that we can't get to the next step without redevelopment funds. And we, you know, the affordable housing professionals are absolutely scrambling trying to figure out if there's another way to make this work. One executive director actually, in, you know, in a moment of, of optimism, um, 
said to one of his colleagues, you know, this is a really exciting time to be an executive director of a nonprofit housing builder because whenever do you get the opportunity to completely rethink your industry and rethink about how you go about doing your work and, and running your business? And, and the, I don't know if you have, you talk to these guys all the time. Yeah, the positive way to look at it is uh, don't confuse the job with the tool and that the job of community reinvestment and affordable housing is going to continue to be important to the state. A particular tool, redevelopment, may go away, but there will need to be other ways of going about it, and it could be exciting to be in on the ground floor of trying to do it. I think the more realistic is that this is just such a draconian change with no time to evolve that it will create chaos uh, in the ability to produce affordable housing, particularly rental housing, for years to come. Uh, not only because of the dollars that go into the housing itself, because the entire infrastructure of nonprofit and for-profit affordable housing developers to say nothing of the infrastructure of lots of fine human beings who have devoted their lives to redevelopment and affordable housing inside of local government will disappear. And you just don't turn that off and replace it overnight. Can I just follow up on that question a bit? Are there, are there synergies that will be lost <laughs> if redevelopment in California goes away, in some orderly way, not to overnight. But are there opportunities for collaboration, leverage, making better use of other people's money that arises because we have these, this um, uh, kind of odd structure in California? Well, I mean, maybe one partial response to that is the way with NSP that we had to make um, we had to make new friends. We had to meet people that we didn't know existed before. And we had those national organizations that came to our aid that had other contacts. And we were able to cobble together a program that has generally worked in the way Congress envisioned it. And you know, to again, to quote that executive director, it's an opportunity to reinvent our business. But Jack, you know. Well, and, and in terms of a very practical synergy, I mean, we have the federal low-income housing tax credit program. Uh, we have HUD programs for uh, rental housing of various types. Uh, none of those federal programs produce enough to fill the whole gap between what it costs to produce affordable housing and what the private sector alone can bring to the table. It can go a long way, but there's still a gap. And it's the local match and that's been redevelopment, and you can't just turn that off and not also turn off the use of hundreds of millions of dollars of federal program assistance as well. Yeah, and that's part of the key. The federal programs require a match. So how do you match that when there's no general fund left and there's no redevelopment? So. Yeah, I, yeah, no, I, 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 I agree, and I'm very concerned about that because I think the California Redevelopment Association, which is the trade association of the 400 redevelopment agencies, and the California League of Cities have, have staked out a pretty aggressive legal and policy position that redevelopment is entitled to business as usual, um, that the voters have said that they're entitled to business as usual, and that any cons and that they're and that any concession is as, as a statement that maybe they're weak when they feel they need to be strong. And so I actually don't think, even though California Redevelopment Association has put out a proposal, it's a very watered down 
opt-in kind of proposal where business as usual unless you want to opt in to help out the state. Um, I don't think the level of reform we need is going to come from that direction, quite frankly. I, I think it's going to have to come from a coalition of affordable housing developers, infill developers, uh, and community organizations that see that business as usual can't continue. Uh, it shouldn't go to the opposite extreme of just blow up the box and hope something takes its place, uh, but it can't. I don't think it's going to evolve ultimately from the redevelopment industry itself. Um, I th and hey, I work in the redevelopment industry, and I you know I worry about getting quoted about some of these things. But I'm I'm trying to be honest with people, um, and even if even if redevelopment maybe um, you know escaped by one vote and is not going to get killed this year. Um, it's just gonna prolong the debate. And unless and until there's really meaningful reform, we're just gonna to continue to have appeals to voters through the initiative process, which is a crummy way of, of doing public policy in California, and the courts, which is also not a good way to resolve this kind of discussion. Um, and so, you know, the redevelopment community may stave off elimination this year, but unless there's a more meaningful level of reform of meeting somewhere in between we're just putting off the inevitable, and we're just putting off the problem for more and more years. You mean the budget problem, more than the, uh, the, the, the problem of where redevelopment fits in the galaxy of overall state, uh, you know, state priorities. Okay, we have one more question, please. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask about, and you were saying that 400 cities, there's a lot more cities in California, and a lot of people do not have redevelopment, and that's always seems to, and I, of course, they could have tried to get a redevelopment agency, but some didn't because it's gotten harder and harder. And so they don't have access to those affordable housing funds. So if we do rethink something, perhaps it will be more accessible to, to all of our members. No, Jack? I, I think that's an important point. We do have jurisdictions that aren't able to develop affordable housing because they don't have that local match, so it would be beneficial. The state has tried a number of times to have housing trust funds with a dedicated source of funds to go into affordable housing, and we pass these bond measures instead, and that's not sustainable either. Well, thanks very much, Jack, Kara, Rebecca. Thanks.